Welcome to In the Clinic by Dr. Butch Levy. This month's episode is titled Clinical Treatments for Women's Issues, Part 2, specifically focusing on menopause. Hi, good morning. Welcome to our next session on women's health. We're going to talk today about menopause, and I believe it's becoming more and more important as our population ages to be able to help provide relief from symptoms and act as a way of enhancing the quality of life that women experience during this time. I think that Chinese medicine, often integrated with naturopathic or Western medicine, offers an opportunity to give women much more flexibility and opportunity to enjoy their lives. As we know, the aging process tends to drain the bank account, metaphorically. And our goal is to balance that out with our ability to energetically deal with the organ systems and bring them into situations where we're able to support them and nourish them and keep them strong for the remainder of people's lives. So we're gonna talk about some of the symptomatic problems that women might experience and also some of the preventive things that need to be looked at to allow for the opportunity to intervene before chronic illness really develops. One of the most common aspects that is really undervalued in Chinese medicine overall is is the concept that occurs in the Japanese compo style of herbal medicine. And it's called oketsu, which is chronic blood stagnation. Now, this is something that can occur locally, perhaps in a what you might consider like a, a bruise or um, a hematoma, or it could be a hemorrhoid, or it could be systemic blood stagnation that results in vascular issues, varicose veins, MI, stroke. And the issue is, is that it can present at different forms at any age. And the Japanese have looked at this related to the hara as being a sign of potential systemic issues that can go on. I think that in the younger age groups, um, it's generally not a major problem, but you can see it's certainly more traumatic. Things can happen in the younger age group. Um, for children, for blood stagnation, um, moving the chi will move the blood. So doing shonashin is very effective. I think that when we start seeing blood stagnation in the younger age groups, it tends to be transitory or if it's not, it's easier to manage with acupuncture and nerves. But I think as it becomes chronic, oftentimes it goes unrecognized until some kind of significant um, symptomatic illness occurs. And our goal is to make sure that we are able to differentiate it early on. So the belief is, is that blood stagnation can certainly be caused by dietary aspects. Poor diet, things that affect the liver and the spleen, you know, alcohol, um, processed foods, various things can affect it. Lifestyle for sure, especially in terms of exercise and stress levels. Um, Initially it was felt that in ancient times that the pathogenic factors created chronic blood stagnation or trauma. I think today we see people living longer. So while the pathogenic evils can be an issue, I think it's the aging process that's resulting in what's going on. Because as you can see, you can have a deficiency of any of the other vital substances of blood and yin, qi and yang. And these can influence and cause chronic blood stagnation. So I think when you're seeing people, which we do at this age of having these deficiencies, 
it's often difficult to differentiate whether or how much the blood is playing a part. I mean, we certainly know of deficient pulses in blood, but we're going to talk more about how to differentiate that. Certainly, um, pain that worsens at night, bruising and ecchymosis, those are common things. We can see internal bleeding and external bleeding with you know, external being clots with menstrual flow, can be seen superficially with hemorrhoids, um, GI bleeding or varices, which are varicose veins in the esophagus from liver dysfunction. Those are ones that are not uncommon. In autoimmune problems, Raynaud's phenomenon, varicose veins, blood stagnation in the upper part of the body causing headaches, the stagnation of blood and chi usually uh, in CVA and paralysis. And often there's that dark tongue. I see that less commonly. And obviously the critical things we're looking at are the issues that can be um, much more impactful on life. They can be um, emboli, phlebitis, CVAs, MIs. So blood stagnation runs a gamut from traumatic aspects that, or symptomatic aspects with hemorrhoids or varicose veins, all the way to systemic problems that can cause, you know, stagnation with emboli and phlebitis and and different vascular impacts. So um, in the younger group, as we talked about, um, from like infancy to adolescence, it's often liver excess and it's menstrual issues and it's you know, tantrums and outbursts and anger. And um, during the menstruating years, it can be excess or deficient related depending on often uh, constitutional aspects and diet and stress. Um, and often when you start seeing it um, in the lower aspects, this can of often extend and you can see stagnation in the lower extremities where you see the varicose veins and some edema, various things that can go along with it. Um, most of the time, what we see is that most blood stagnation, at least in the Hara, isn't seen till perimenopause. And often it initially appears in the upper jaw as MIs and high blood pressure and angina. So that's the presentation um, at earlier perimenopausal time. But as you get into menopause, we start seeing much more in the way of symptomatic things that can play a role. As we talked about earlier, in the infancy and adolescence, acupuncture, shonashin, herbs can support deficiency, move the excess. But I think that as we start getting older, um, it takes more work to energetically get the blood moving. And I think the important aspect is that the blood needs to be moved consistently and continually throughout a person's life to really help this. You know, usually though, around menopause, menopause creates a blood deficiency. And this is when you start seeing chronic blood stagnation. Um, it's, it's often depending on the constitution, can be a deficient form of blood stagnation or an excess form based on that. And so once we get it more balanced, then the goal is to continue this continually circulation and preventing stagnation. And the other thing that happens is when we start getting this type of oketsu pattern, kidney jing also, um, develops in the hara. So you end up with a dual problem. So simplified 
blood stagnation acupuncture is a lot of moxa, often on the back shoe points, liver three, spleen 10, and then a lot of deep ashi needling in the abdomen to kind of move the concept of the blood in the lower abdomen. It's not really that the blood is often stagnant there, but the energetic of the blood is reflected. REN17, pericardium 6 are also involved. It's an interesting treatment extra vessel wise in that the goal is to cross over the extra vessels, uh, left foot, right hand, right foot, left hand, so that it crosses over that mid abdomen in the hara. And you're trying to move the blood. So acupuncture is designed so that the master is pericardium 6 and Spleen four, the, the chong is silver, so it's moving from the chong to the yin wei with the goal of, if it's st stagnant, to move it, and then to use um, channel divergent number two, which is gallbladder, and move and, and um, try to work with the liver in that one because of the liver blood, and also to work with the pericardium in the heart. So this is what Oketsu really looks like in the compo model. Below the umbilicus, from the umbilicus on an angle towards the anterior superior iliac spine, the area in there is where you palpate to really look for Oketsu.